made the weird noise. Yes, I'm gonna set that up really quick. And this needs to go away. There we go. All right, I'm going to switch on to my microphone so hopefully everybody can hear me and the people here can also keep speaking. Um, thank you, Elliot, for introducing me. Um, as Elliot said, my, uh, I'm KP, I'm an artist and jeweler based in Providence, and I'm talking to you uh, from the Baltimore Jewelry Center where my one month residency uh, is already coming to a close, which is kind of wild. Um, and I want to take a moment to first recognize that Baltimore is on ancestral and unsurrendered land, um, particularly of the Piscataway people. Um, I also really want to express my sincere gratitude to Shane, April, Elliot, Lydia, and the entirety of the Baltimore Jewelry Center community um, my time here has been really incredible and more than I could have ever imagined, so thank you. Um, and lastly, I want to thank you all for being here with me. Um, it's an incredible privilege to share space with you, whether in person uh, or virtually, um, and get to share my ideas and work with you. I really appreciate it, and um, let's begin. Um, uh, to begin, I grew up in a small town called Random Lake, Wisconsin. My town is a town of 1500 people with stereotypically more cows than people uh, a cheese factory and a grocery store my parents worked late and traveled often for their jobs so my grandparents would pick me up from school feed me dinner and often with their really heavy yiddish accents read me bedtime stories if i wasn't helping my grandma rosie cook in her sunken mid-century kitchen my weekends and afternoons were spent working alongside my grandfather in his garage wood shop. He had his saws, his mock-ups, and false work for ongoing projects, all staged on a wall that was opposite his very prized and parked white Chevy. It never left. Um, my grandfather, Lou, was an incredibly gentle soul, considering all that he had been through in his life. Lou was a third gener generation Jewish carpenter, and he would often take me along to those work sites and I would watch him build from the barest foundations to the smallest miter detail until something that was the bones of a house became somewhere someone lived. Um, I watched and he made sure that I learned. And it wasn't until I was much older that I really fully understood why it was so important uh, to him that I would learn these skills. Oops, no arrow time, it's all right. Um, by the time my grandfather made it to America after fleeing the Nazis, he had lost any remainder or reminder of where he had come from that he couldn't carry with him. He was only 16 years old when he arrived in New York and he had lost his world and arrived in a land where he could barely even speak the language. But what he could do was build. Carpentry was the way he could feed himself and prove his worth in a society that saw a refugee as nothing but a burden. And like many displaced people, my family's without heirlooms. Um, the silver Judaica and ritual objects that are so central to our sense of self and cultural identity were either left behind or destroyed as he and his family fled Europe. He had no objects to pass down, but he did have skills and stories that told us who we were. My grandfather taught me everything I know about woodworking. I can say that sawdust is in my blood, but Working with wood with my hands is a little bit more than that. Um, the lessons I learned from my grandfather and really watching him continue to live his life after what he had gone through taught me a philosophy of making so far beyond just methods. Woodworking and wood carving feel like home to me. Um, this making is an act of preservation. Wood as a material that I am in constant conversation with is a pretty loud voice to talk with. Um, you know, as a tree grows, it collects. Its rings and knots accumulate at the events that it's witnessed and its bark is tarnished by the time it endures. Wood is a storyteller in its own materiality. It's obvious to say that trees are living, but the wood of their corpses has the scars they collect throughout life. 
wood is an archive that's catalog has been terminated. And carving back into that block of wood, I can expose those inherent tensions in that material record. Um, carving has always been a sort of act of truth for me in that way. Um, it's a uniquely reciprocal process that necessitates acknowledging the material agency of what you're carving. But carving is also consequential. It's an act of finality. There's no going back to return to a state before wounds were enacted upon a material. It's an allowance to move forward, to embrace this error, these events as new paths. It allows forms kind of inherent to the blank and block of wood to be released from their entombment. It's through this process I can begin to replace the objects we lost, create rather than destroy lineages, build and reconnect. Working in carpentry and wood is more than just familial nostalgia to me. It's a way of holding conversations in a familial language on topics that would never be discussed at the dinner table. Um, when I began this body of work, I was really thinking about trauma, um, particularly the trauma that comes with being the other, um, the effect of being alienated from where you come from. When made other, a body comes under stress. Space ceases to conform to its presence and movements, and the societal structures that are meant to guide and support and confine the conventional body all fail and fall short. I want to specify that as I'm talking about a queer experience, I am not only discussing the effects of sexual orientation or gender expression. Queerness, as I'm discussing here, is a relationship to power and something that is always relative shifting and really not easily confined by definitions. To pass in this dialogue is to be seen as the conventional or the expected. Passing is an allowance to exist without the constant fear of retaliation for being your authentic self in a system where that authenticity is often antagonistic, undesirable, other, or queer. Passing is a privilege that is not afforded to all bodies that might need it to in order to survive, but passing is also a practice of potential erasure. If a body blends, it's because it's camouflaging itself and hiding the wounds that are enacted upon it in order to pretend and blend. The passing body is still in the state of otherness, of ongoing inflicted alienation. And the price of that passing is to suffer in silence. This is an inherently alienating experience and our society's coping mechanisms for trauma, which we all know are terrible, have been a massive point of frustration for me. Um, the expectations of closure, of resolution, of moving on, and that trauma was something to be undone were some things I could just not get through my head. And the knotworks became an opportunity to explore that unending, ongoing nature of living with trauma in a way that actually allows me to embrace the tenderness and slowness that working with it requires. When I approach the blank of wood, the knots and their forms are already within them. I'm never adding anything back into them. And as I spend time with that wood, carving, removing materials, refining the surfaces, refining the wounds, the knots lighten and they loosen. I call them partially undone, and that's all they can ever be. Their gestures rendered slowly in between being fully tightened and completely unraveled. They are given the allowance and power to be perpetually unresolved. They're objects of tension that bind nothing in place but their own existence, and through that, they will never come undone. My partially undone knots pass as knots, as not wood, until they're handled until they're made contact with. The weight or often lack thereof defies what we would invent of the dark hues and gravity of drapery, and they hold form as they move through space. Um, they're wooden and unmoving, and this is really only fully understood once you hold them in your hands, wear them, and move with them. Uh, carving is not really the end of these wooden formed objects either, um, because Caring for a piece of hardwood that's been handled and shaped is a pretty big commitment within itself. Um, my objects don't just need to be worn to perform, but they also need to be maintained. To make sure that wood doesn't dry, crack, 
and break. There's this traditional adage in woodworking that you need to oil and hydrate the wood once an hour for a day, once a day for a week, once a, day, once a week for a month, once a month for a year, and once a year for a lifetime. There's no moment of resolution. There's no moving on, only development as they're lived with. And this ongoing relationship is how we can work against alienation, otherness. It's how we can foster connection and it's how we can allow some tenderness and some practice care that we so desperately need. It's these reciprocal moments, these relationships and exchanges of dependency that work against isolation. And in that jewelry as a format, as a thing in our lives is inherently relational. It's always in relationship to the body it's worn by, in relationship to the environment or situation it's worn through, and in conversation with the societal systems within which it's created. Jewelry is contextual and unfixed in its nature, but also in the discourses it's an interplay with. The categories and label we try, labels we try to contain jewelry within fail, and jewelry resists them because this attempt at punctuation goes against the very nature of jewelry. It moves between. The field of contemporary jewelry is in kind of constant flux and confusion between discussions of art, craft, design, decoration, frivolity, and all the rest. And jewelry exists between, among, and outside all of these categories. And that indeterminate, non-fixed position is a position of power. Being able to move with bodies and between dialogues allow these works of art to infiltrate beyond boundaries that they would otherwise be contained or limited by. No matter how beautiful, impactful, or, pow or powerful um, a painting is, it can always be walked past. A sculpture can be walked around. Jewelry walks up to you. But these objects don't only exist in dependency of human interaction. And I think a lot about how these works live off the body, in space or at rest. I often create hooks or installations that serve as a place for the jewelry to return to when they are not carried. And through that, they become fixtures in the home and start to cohabitate. Um, in fact, this piece was actually installed um, at the Pratt Institute for New York City Jewelry Week. Um, and during the opening, someone had actually hung their coat on the dowel <laughs> next to the book, and it was just there for the entire two hour opening. Um, but it's that sort of like sense of familiarity um, and that sense of living with the work that really is what excites me most. Um, to that end, I began making boxes by hand for each of the works. Uh, each of these tension fit boxes is cut and milled from the exact same piece of material that the knot is carved from. Um, their containers graded really only to ever accept the specific piece that they're paired with. And through this, it allows the work to, in some way, return to the material it was removed from and rest in a memory of what it once was. From this carved gesture back to block of wood. Uh, to take a moment, I want to think back on that block of material, um, wood and the bodies it comes from. Uh, when working with a material that was once living, it's easy to romanticize and personify the individuality of that tree that once witnessed and experienced life. But something that has been at the forefront of my mind um, and the thinking in my practice is a relatively new understanding of what we perceive as individuals within a species and how that is much more intertwined, connected, entangled than we research has really ever been able to document before. Microhesal networks, or perhaps in more fun terms, the wood wide web uh, is a system of interconnections between tree roots that are facilitated by fungi. The tendrils of various mushrooms uh, dig down into the soil and literally tap into the roots of trees that they've grown near. Mushrooms, which we often think of as parasitic um, to plant life effectively tie together the roots of trees, not only of the same species, but cross spatially and over distances that can encompass entire forest systems. For example, a European beech and a Norwe Norwegian spru uh, spruce, not spru, um, two species that through ta taxonomy are entirely independent and distinct can communicate and exchange through this mediator of the mushroom. 
Uh, and if one of their number is ailing, sickened or under stress, they can even share nutrients by the means of this underground system um, beneath the soil and thereby sometimes nursing that sick tree back to health. The forest works as almost a super organism, not just a collection of individuals in a shared space. Um, these revelations are, I should say, nothing new to indigenous knowledge and traditions, um, but to our Western post-enlightenment scientific understanding, they're pretty uprooting. Excuse that pun. Um, the subtle and reciprocal mutualism and their interconnectivity uh, and, the, and the interconnectivity of forest biology upends all conventional notions of categorization and of naming. Rather than understanding the relationship between individual plants as competition for scarce resources, the wood wide web reveals an interdependency and shared benefit to living in context and conversation. It makes distinguishing between subject and context extremely difficult and points to how counterproductive it can be to isolate individual bodies or concepts in our understanding of them. Um, these ideas are pretty easily co-opted by the humanities and the arts as validation. But jewelry, I think, is uniquely poised to explore the ramifications of the Wood Wide Web, it's precisely because of its proximity and interdependence of bodies in a cross-moving space. The necessity to think of interconnections and networks as it relates to our understanding of ourselves has been pretty central to my thinking for a while, um, but especially as I prepared for my residency here at the Baltimore Jewelry Center. I really wanted to explore new relationships and systems of connection that work. Up until now, I've really only made distinct and individual gestures in wood. And to begin, I really wanted to think about our relationship to gravity. Um, it's always been a starting point for a lot of my work and thinking and just really meditating on that pull between masses, between bodies. Gravity is an issue. Um, it's also inescapable. Um, when you put a piece of jewelry on, no matter how heavy or light, our bodies adjust to accommodate to it. When a pendant pulls you ever so slightly forward, our posture angles backwards and it returns us to equilibrium. This subtle negotiation discreetly changes our own relationship with our bodies and the ground we stand on. It impacts us and the way we move through the world. I wanted to explore how this interplay, this relationship could be activated within a piece itself, independent of any bodily interactions. And this led me to carve these intertwined twin knots. Um, I was really exploring how these objects can be distinct autonomies while still entangled and connected. I really loved the idea that these two bodies that protect, support, uphold, and greet each other um, could be together, but still maintain their individual identities. Lastly, I wanted to experiment uh, with something and what happens basically when I go way beyond this gesture of a single knot and create a system of parts that work together to become something more than the sum of their individual selves. Thinking back to those networks, those wood wide webs. This bundle of sticks unravels and interlocks to become a large necklace that the wearer can enter into. The square knots along its curve almost pulling it together. Um, I began to speak of this work and its roots in trauma. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize that it's kind of irresponsible to lock them there, frozen in that traumatic moment. Because these works, these pieces, these knots live without punctuation, in joy and love and loss and rage and being. They live with us. Amongst these pressures that pull and hold us in place, gravity, connections, binds, and bends, these objects can go beyond limitations of our individual experiences. There's extreme, <laughs> extreme labor uh, in these seemingly simple gestures. Um, you know, a line bent over itself, solid and perpetual. But matter accumulates that experience. Material that is handled, shaped, and cared for is transformed by these interactions. Perhaps it's in these objects, these works of art and time, that we can have an active surrogate of mediators of connection and nourishment. In the time that I spend carving a piece, refining its forms, it becomes an embodiment and condensed block of my time spent with it. And if that work can then be handed off, held, 
and worn by another, by you, it can transfer that care. They become devices against alienation and towards community. This past year and a half has made the importance of this tactile, physical binding together impossible to overstate. It is how we can connect. It's how we can nourish each other. And it pulls us together, no matter the distance and no matter the time. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So we're just, let me put my camera around. We're in the, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Cool, thank you. Um, so we're here with uh, the installation of KP's work. Yeah, if, if people want to move down this way. I'm just doing some sorting. Uh, so yeah, so this is what's kind of living here at the Baltimore Center. Center. Um, oh, hold on one second. Oh, yep. Yeah. So. I'm going to take my headphones out. Can okay. people hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. So this is what's going to be living at the Baltimore Jewelry Center for the next month. And it's all pieces that um, came here as raw material. Um, and all the intentions and expectations I had for the residency kind of went out the window within the first 30 minutes of being here. So uh, I was really excited to kind of have some really um, big breakthroughs and next threads to kind of chase since I've been here. These systems and these interconnected activities are something that I'm really excited about, um, as well as things that come become other things when they're off the body. Um, but like I said, they always kind of have a, a home or a space that you can live with when they go back. Um, it's really important to me that jewelry is not just a thing on the body. It's a thing that lives in the world too. Um, so I hope that this, these works get to live. Um, I love hearing from collectors or from people who have my work, um, about how they keep their work and how they like either goes for a walk with them or it stays in a box. Um, all those relationships really excite me. Um, but yeah, um, that's kind of me talking at you all for about 25 minutes. I'm absolutely happy to answer some questions or hear thoughts. Um, I love discussions. Yeah, so we've got plenty of time for questions from in-person audience or the Zoom audience. So let the questions begin, I guess. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much again for being here. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone who could who, who could make it tonight. Yeah. Hi, Fred. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that you chose to have the knot on the necklace like a, uh, attached mm -hmm. yeah, instead of being free for. And to me, that kind of speaks to a commentary almost on time because it's like both a temporary thing that has spaciousness and yet they're frozen in this moment. And to me, like I also think of how even any of our like dynamics and relationships or even communities that we enter can be temporary things and yet last forever with us. Mm -hmm. I'm curious like do you think like how do you when you're contemplating this, how do you like plan into it? Yeah. Okay, so for everyone that <laughs> That's a long question, but basically is the question I think is how does time weigh into these pieces, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. everyone can hear. Um, no, I mean, time is something I think about a lot. Like for example, in this piece, like I really wanted those knots to actually not be the moments of connection and movement. I wanted them frozen. Um, so they would be perpetually holding together that gesture. Um, but time is something I do want to talk about very briefly in the context of like, what it means to be a queer body and a queer maker, um, largely because in order to envision a queer life that is uninhibited, you always have to either think back to an idealic past or a futuristic uh, goal that we have not yet reached. And that disassociation can be really alienating but it is also freeing because you 
aren't locked into the moment. And so I think about that a lot as I'm making these pieces that are meant to exist. Like I have, I very much think of the wearer or the collector as a participant in the work. Um, again, like I think the story really only ever exists in the context of where it's born. And that can be immediately right now or 20 years in the future as these things become heroines. Um, yeah, it's something I think about a lot and I don't think I will ever stop. Time is something we can't escape to. Gravity and time, it's all we got. <laughs> that was a really excellent question. Yeah, thank you. Any, like, <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> Mary and Sandy. Um, thanks, that was great. I was thinking about the fact that you trained as a doomer mm -hmm. and you teach metalsmithing. Um, but your work in the window we see here is all about subtractive processes yeah. where a lot of metal is not subtractive, it's additive. Do you ever miss additive? And do you ever oh, think like no. it's going to go into your wood in some way? Or you're going to like find a way of doing that? Or yeah. do you think subtractive processes are what this work means and you're going to stay there? Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. That's a great question. Um, I miss metalsmithing every time I'm making something and teaching <laughs> definitely allows me to get that out in some capacity, but also makes me more excited about metals. Um, but on the training notion, it actually took me a long time to allow myself to work in wood. Um, I had never taken a class in wood. I had never um, you know, done it as my practice or profession, but it was a knowledge that I had like literally embodied within me and surrounding me all the time. Um, so it did take a long time to kind of break down that training. Um, it really was just allowance. It wasn't even training. Um, but thinking about how the, those like material structures, when I would just argue methodologies of metal smithing. Um, I do everything with a jeweler saw and a flex shaft and hand tools. Um, I do not work like a carpenter. Um, and I think that that methodology shows through. And I think that I tell this to my students all the time that. Whether jewelry is your end all be all or simply a methodology of understanding, those skills are things you can't unlearn. And that attention to what it means to hold something like this and let it become a whole world um, is something that you can never escape from because it's too powerful once you realize it. Yeah. Another great question. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about the um, the surfaces you're sort of creating. Um, I, I really like the sort of richness and the depth of them, but I'm I'm, I'm interested to hear like like why you're specifically working with the surfaces yeah. that you do work with. I know there's a lot of time and energy in that part of the process as well. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. Um, so but, the, so the question is about the surfaces that KP is yeah. working towards. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that, like that investigation of passing. Uh, I want to like allow these to be convincingly not wood, at least for a moment, um, even if it is super legible. Once, like for example, in this like raw cherry piece, like, but like the finish isn't splintering. Um, and I think it also goes back to the fastidious as we learn as jewelers, um, but allowing this object to be confidently itself and not necessarily have to point to the process that it was made from. Um, you know, it's it's still carved. There are moments that are like, this could not be made in other way without carving. Um, but it allows it to kind of have, I think, and at least in my thinking, um, some agency and some like allowance of just being the thing. Um, as far as like choosing between like dark and natural tones in the surface and finish, like that is, a, I'm gonna just say, it's an entirely intuitive process at the moment. I need to investigate it further, perhaps, but I'm always drawn to dark things. I think that darkness is often a mode of vision. Um, and that's something we've talked about for a long time. Um, but I've learned that sometimes, um, particularly the gallery loop or the necklace, that the cherry really needs to be the cherry. Um, I, don't, I don't know what that is yet. And that's something I maybe need to write on a little bit more. So um, I loved hearing like the very complete thoughts you have about wood as a material and just like how in depth you have like ruminated on it. 
Um, and I'm curious if there's any other material that you would consider making these knots out of that you feel carries the same weight, like yeah. essentially. Yeah. So um, material as far as like other ways that can carry this conceptual baggage basically. Um, and I do think often a lot about just like the materiality of metal and stone um, as it relates to like these like incredible timelines. You know, a tree is yes, a product of millions of years of evolution, but it's birthed and normally fell within a span of a couple of years. Um, whereas a piece of marble takes millennia to become. And so it's entirely different timelines. Um, but I think that micro and macro shifting is what's really exciting because like the experience of, and Catherine Youssef gets into this in A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, which is an amazing book that everybody should read, um, but about how these macro times are actually just micro times on a different scale. Um, yeah, it's definitely something I'm excited about. I have all these different materials in my studio back home that I like, I'm like, maybe. <laughs> maybe, no, okay, back to wood. Um, <laughs> but I don't think, I don't think wood is, is like, it's definitely my home. Uh, I don't know if it's my only place to visit. Yeah. Can you explain the brooches? Are they all hunks? Like, how do you get brooches? Yeah, so I, I will say, like, I often do add silver findings, uh, but they're really limited in their interventions. Like, it's normally just like a tube on a wire and then a catch. Um, but these are appendages that are going to be hanging from strands. Um, I really thought every time I try to like do a, a like classic metal smith move, um, it ends up being really overcomplicated and completely robs pieces of what they need to be. And I end up being like, oh, okay, here's a little gold dot. <laughs> um, but yeah, so normally there's like a, a really, I work really hard to make sure that my lines are almost like invisible except for the two uh, or if they are visible, they're like a really intentional, like normal. But again, that's something I'm always like, always playing around with. And maybe, maybe the next thing will just be a, a giant hinge. Who knows? Mm -hmm. If you think about exploring a symbol beyond the knot, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Shane. Um, so, so going beyond the knot, um, it is, it is something I'm like cautious of being like locked into. Um, but also it keeps giving to me. Um, I'm going to keep it around as long as it needs to be with me. I definitely like have like sketches and material samples and tons of like pieces of progress in my home studio that are either tangentially or completely unrelated, but those have to be private for a little bit longer, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I definitely am not done with the knots, but they're also becoming mature to me. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Lucy? Um, you come with the decision of your display on this table. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so about the display, I spend a lot of time looking at like, interior architecture and just like different movements throughout that, particularly the American heritage. Um, and I think the shakers are an incredibly fascinating um, existence and experience that is actually still for continuing in some ways today. Um, but about this like devotional practice to simplicity um, as both a theological and philosophical um, way of being is like something I think about a lot. Like, the fact that it had to be the board and the peg and nothing more um, is something I think about a lot. And also just how it became this like, not just a functional thing, but like this like sign that you were in a shape or home. Um, I also just wanted something that like all the pieces could interact with um, without having like different hangers. Um, and it is something I like, just really like. <laughs> But yeah, the shakers are definitely something I look at a lot, as well as like the century craft, um, as well as like gothic architecture. Right? It's all all of those things at once. It makes me think of um, tech storage, where horse harnesses and 
Yeah, they become their story. They're almost tool like. Um, and I do think of them as devices, as uh, agents against something or for something. Um, like, uh, one of my doctors actually told me about how she has her piece on like on the floor, and if she needs it that day, she'll put it on. <laughs> and I really love that. Like, I love the other actors, like, okay, I need this now. Just like you with a screwdriver or um, a bridle if you're going to work that way. And your thoughts may all be the same as you will. Reminding me of a man that I met in Sweden, and he went to the north of Sweden and built a house out of the wood that was on the land, yeah. which is, of course, the traditional world tradition. Yeah, it's definitely about immediacy. Um, I mean, like, for example, I'd like to say that, like, a lot of my wood is salvaged, but that's it's super important to me that it's ethical, just in my own practice and my own living, but like, that's out of convenience. Um, it's out of like, I can't afford new material um, and I have a surplus of salvage wood because my partner does a lot of demos uh, in architecture. Um, so it is a material I just get gifted to me a lot too. I love gifts if you have salvage wood, please. Um, <laughs> um, it. Um, but yeah, I do think about like, I talked about like the idea of like a tree being meant for a place. Um, and if something comes into my life, maybe it's meant to be made into something. That being said, if a piece breaks while I'm making it, I'm just like, okay, I don't want to be a brooch. <laughs> definitely had that, definitely had that happen. You mentioned how your plans for the residency shifted after three mm -hmm. years. Can you just reflect on like how maybe like personal growth or just what you were going through during your residency? I think I just, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I came here with intentions of working on a couple pieces that I had been thinking about for such a long time. And I knew they would be really time intensive. And I was like, oh, a residency will allow me to do that. And then I started working on them and I was like, I don't care about this anymore. <laughs> um, and I realized that like it, it served a purpose in that moment in time when I had thought of it, but it wasn't, it didn't need to be carried forward. And I just, so I started immediately, I was like, okay, like, I want to get my hands going. And so this this intertwined idea had just come to my mind largely because I was thinking again about those entanglements. So like, how does how do I make this happen? And so I just kind of let it happen. And this necklace was never in the cards. I was actually um I had a pretty strong no necklace rule uh, in my studio for a couple of reasons. Um and with conversations that I had here, um, particularly with like Shane, Leslie, Mandy, um, and Dolin. I was able to be like, oh, why do I have a necklace over here? Oh, this is totally unfounded. <laughs> oh, I don't need to be doing this. Why am I doing this myself? Um, so yeah, that kind of like breakthrough was really only mediated by the community here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, um, I guess like not work. Yeah. <laughs> when you're trying to model this, do you ever like have Rope models and their process of kind of like laying a certain way and frozen. And yeah, you do that. Is there like once you've made the piece, do you feel like there's like a relationship between the two? Oh, like, totally. Yeah. So I think about the like my modeling process is pretty central to a lot of my thinking. Um, I've modeled in a ton of different materials, whether it's string, wax, uh, sculpey with wire meshes. Um, but I try to always use a modeling material that is able to be affected by the force I'm trying to replicate, like something that will actually bend to gravity, aka like thin wax, or something that will hold structure and hold a curve, like um, a sculpt, like hard and sculpty. Um, but those are, yeah, especially the more complicated forms. Some of the forms I don't need models anymore just because of my familiarity with like what needs to be removed and what needs to stay. But to figure out new systems, I, I make model after model, drawing after drawing and figure out what works best. Yeah. Any questions from Zoom? Yeah, does anyone have questions from afar? Hi, <laughs> should we just shout them out? Oh, uh, yeah. Hold yeah. On. Um, so, KP, um, are there uh, questions that you feel you've outgrown 
do, like if you're looking to answer questions in your process, like what are some things perhaps that you've moved on from? Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, yeah. I mean, I come from a tradition of asking questions. I mean, that's like living the question is a very like Jewish experience. And so like, it's always about the re reiteration of that. That being said, like there are definitely investigations that I haven't necessarily answered, but realized don't need to be answered to me at least. Um, you know, when I started thinking about like jewelry, I was really fascinated by like the societal symbols, uh, gold, diamond, emblems, uh, wealth that could be portrayed through them. And I realized that like, those systems are so ingrained that I, they're so ingrained so de facto that I am allowed to just make an alternative and let it be real enough for me. Um, try to create a system around that is kind of impossible and insurmountable. Um, but as far as questions that I've like really outgrown, there's, yeah, I, I would say that that's probably something I need to read on and think about, but yeah, I should probably shed myself with some of these questions and add new ones. I have a comment there, you know, a question. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about um, people needing to foil the work once they own it and sort of continue that process of caring for the object, it made me think how uh, maybe that is like new a new idea to a lot of people that mm -hmm. like maybe are thinking about buying a piece of jewelry. Um, and like, you know, not just giving some, someone something, but like also asking something mm -hmm. of someone. That's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if you think about yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, that's like why I'm so interested in, so about like this notion of like having to maintain the work after it's in your possession. Um, it's something I'm really interested in as far as like a practice, just because it puts onus on the wearer to be actually a participant, actually a caregiver, um, or they can neglect the piece, um, but that's on them. And so it becomes this like need to like recognize your positionality and that power dynamic. Like, are you gonna take care of this piece? Are you actually willing to invest your time and care and love into this object? Or do you just like it? Um, I like building obligations like that. I think it points to a lot of the ways that we interact without them. Um, but maybe just in an overt way. Yeah. I also think it speaks to um, all too often not common now practice of like taking care of what we purchase. Yeah. You know, like thinking about how people might have had one belt, you know, like a few years and years and actually willing whether but I, I also think like I, I think that it is a relationship when you own a piece of jewelry when you own a piece of artwork it's a relationship and those relationships take a lot of maintenance when they're first made a little bit less over time but they never stop needing that check-in that care um and so I think that like by creating these objects that perpetually need that um it just points to Again, that obligation, that, that necessity of connections and actually maintaining those connections, tending to the garden. Any other questions from Zoom or from our audience in person? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all Thank so you, much. Around, so if you can say hi. Thank you guys so much for being here. It really means the world. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming. I'll mention again that um, programs like the um, Baltimore Jewelry Center residency are brought to you um, or are made possible, actually, uh, rather by uh, donations. So. Um, we want more residents.
We do. We want more residents. Um, Shane, do you want to say anything before we um, sign thanks off? Thanks for coming. It's just so nice that we continue to have an online audience. And I know people are coming and joining us from afar. So it's really lovely that you came to be here. And I hope you can come out for more of us in the future. Cool. Thanks so much, y'all. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Have a good evening. And thanks to everyone that came. Thank <laughs> you.